From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today from the 2019 K-State Research and Extension Conference taking place on the campus this week, K-State's Sandy Johnson talks with us about turning the beef cow herd out on corn and milo stover post-harvest. Some guidelines for evaluating the nutritional quantity that's out there and then the carrying capacity of that stover. Then Britton Rucker talks with two district extension agricultural agents from western Kansas about how 2019 has gone for their producers. Elisa Rippy May of the Twin Creeks District and Lacey Noterman of the Wild West District. Later on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd on several landscape insects that may draw you homeowners' attention here in midfall. Here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.com. .ksu.edu This is the K-State Radio Network. Welcome once more to Agriculture Today. Well, we're certainly not through the row crop harvest in Kansas, a ways to go, but getting there. And for you cow-calf producers with interest in utilizing what's left after harvest as a nutritional resource for your herd, we have some thoughts for you to consider now with our guest, who happens to be here in Manhattan for the annual K-State Research and Extension Conference on the campus. Sandy Johnson is a beef systems specialist, K-State Research and Extension, based in northwest Kansas, and she's as you might expect, getting questions about this now, Sandy. Just generally speaking now, what does the opportunity for grazing look like out there? Are, are stover resources fairly ample, do you think? Well, there's uh, historically we have a lot of tons of, of stover available, and at some point I guess I should add up the state number, but uh, we certainly have a lot of opportunity. I do worry about some that has blown either to Nebraska or Oklahoma, but uh, hopefully we've retained uh, some of that. And for cow-calf producers, a great opportunity to utilize some of that. And uh, I always think of the, I hate to see it blow, and anything a cow eats, half of it's going to stay on the field, and it's not, those leaves and husks aren't blowing somewhere else. So that's a great opportunity I see. But you mentioned the wind, and there's a special consideration in parts of Kansas now where corn that was going to grain isn't going to be harvested because it's now on the ground. The uh, alternative there, albeit a, a lesser preference than harvesting that grain, would be to graze that acreage. Right, and we're hearing some early estimates of that. And any time we're going to graze crop residue, it's a good idea to go out and visualize what is down. We've got a lot better hybrids that typically we don't have a lot of down corn in a quote-unquote normal year, but this is not a normal year. So certainly there's areas we know where they'll have to go out and do that, and we have some little rules of thumb for estimating that if you you need to, and you know you're simply counting the number of ears down in a we recommend three different 100-foot strips and divide that number by two. So the total of the ears up on each of those and divide by two, and that's roughly the number of bushels on the ground. And, you know, when that gets to be over eight to ten bushels, we probably need to have some planning done before we turn something out. So do check that out before you graze. And then the, the other thing, we know that residue is very important to keep on our soil to protect it. And so we really encourage producers to do a little math on terms of determining stocking rate. And we shouldn't look at leaving cows out there as, uh, use that as a dry lot necessarily. The leaves and husks have a good nutritional quality. And if we can keep them eating those leaves and husks, uh, we still leave plenty of residue, move on to another piece. Depending on the corn situation, they'll, you know, clean that up. One rule of thumb we can use to calculate number of grazing days if we take Uh, about a 1200 pound cow and some of our cows are bigger so be realistic and adjust if needed but if we have a 180 bushel yield 
and divide that 180 bushel by 3.5, we get uh, roughly grazing days for that 1,200 pound cow. And that math is, boom in my head, uh, is 51 grazing days. If you've got bigger cows, that number would be fewer grazing days per acre. And so, you know, take a little time, do that math. Don't, um, like I said, don't use these as, as a dry lot. Clean up the goody and, and move on as, as best you can. And I think the other thing from that standpoint, uh, you know, we have some people that are focused just on grain farming, concerned about compaction. If we do them right by not taking too much off of there, they're going to be better partners in doing that. So I really encourage producers to do that. And, you know, we have some other, we can calculate that more precisely and estimate residue, but that, that's a good rule of thumb. And the important thing is to actually just do some math. Yields are not consistent from year to year and make sure we're not taking off too much residue. If one's thinking in terms of grazing days per acre, then how does one come up with a per acre stocking rate? How does that tie in? Well, yeah, I wish I had my blackboard now, but, you know, we, we can look at this several different ways. An animal unit month refers to how much uh, dry forage a 1,000-pound animal would consume. Well, we don't have too many 1,000-pound animals, but essentially you can come at it two ways. Either I'm going to put, I've got so many animals and I can leave them on there for so many days, or I want to be here for so many days, how many animals I can put on there. I can help you with that math easier off of the radio and be happy to do that. But the point is there's so much that we can take off of there, and the cow eats so much a day, we just need to do the math and be uh, conservative in our estimate so we protect that soil. We'll tell folks in a moment how to get a hold of you to help them walk through the math. Does one think differently, though, generally speaking, Sandy, in terms of determining stocking rates or grazing days per acre, depending on whether it is a spring calving herd or a fall calving herd where the nutritional needs of the cow will differ? Right. You know, whether it's, it it could be a growing calf, it could be lactating cow, it could be a dry cow. So the, the intake of a lactating cow is going to be slightly higher than, than our dry cows in a spring calving situation. So we do need to uh, take that into consideration. And in some of these cases where there is a lot of down corn, that lactating cow is actually going to be a better use of that because some of our dry cows could actually get a little roly-poly from what I'm hearing in a few instances. So, yeah, we're always trying to best match what the cow's needs are to the forage resources. And and sometimes it's really pushing a fall calving cow to live on corn stalks. It's going to take a lot more supplementation, assuming there's not a lot of corn down or else very, very light grazing. So they're really just getting the goody and the corn and moving very quickly. And I don't know if that fits many situations, but that fall calving cow has much greater needs than the dry cow. Speaking of supplementation in all cases, does one not need to give thought to mineral supplementation? Yes, you know, we've got uh, low quality forage generally in that corn stalks, and so a, a much higher phosphorus supplementation than what we have uh, year round is going to be needed. And uh, then, depending on your grazing plans, if the cows are in good body condition, these are dry cows in good body condition. And we're, we're grazing, as I've recommended, in terms of taking, essentially, we're really just trying to take the leaves and the husks and move on, and any, any corn. We probably wouldn't have to supplement those with any additional energy or protein initially in the fall. Then as those stocks are going to decline in quality as time goes on, and then we may need to add some additional protein. And of course, if we had cows in poor body condition and we're trying to pick up some body condition, we'd want to add a little more protein supplement to that. And perhaps energy, again, depending just on what their body condition is to try and bring them up to better body condition by the time they calve. More than a few variables to account for here. What else needs to be considered when we think about maximizing the utility of that corn or grain sorghum stover, for that matter, and making sure that the cow herd's nutritional necessities are met? Yeah, there, there's uh, always, um, you know, we wish we had some magical fencing thing and water. Those do provide additional challenges, but, you know, 
producers are very inventive and they've got some good ways of putting up fence and, and dealing with those things now, so I commend them on that. And, you know, another thing to think about is most of these fields have nothing for wind protection. And last winter, we certainly had some cows that got stuck out in some pretty severe conditions. We do have some plans for portable windbreak type things. I've seen people use a whole range of things for windbreaks, but you might think about, you know, what could I provide for a portable windbreak if if conditions got really bad. And really, when I think to last winter, you know, some of those cows that were thin this time of year and got some of those storms, boy, they really struggled. And, And I think they're probably open now I don't you know we haven't heard all those results yet but being able to provide some wind protection is a big deal to those cows and I know that does provide a challenge but you know as we think about building our resources over time that would sure be one I would try and figure out how to add to my toolbox very well then and once more K-State Research and Extension has accumulated more than a little information on grazing cow herds on summer crop stover, and that's easily accessed, and you would be, as you say, Sandy, more than welcome to walk through the math of stocking rates and or days on that stover with producers, should they inquire. You bet, you bet. Happy to do that, and I have some little spreadsheets that do some of that math, too, so it's, yeah, easy to help you one-on-one, and we'll we'll leave that to not on radio communication because it's hard to do it visually right here indeed you can contact sandy through the northwest research and extension office web page which is northwest.kstate.edu simply enough and we appreciate the input sandy as always we'll catch up with you again soon thank you glad to be here some thoughts for you cow calf producers as you contemplate turning your herds out on corn or grain sorghum stover here in the weeks ahead. Sandy Johnson, Beef System Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Again, Sandy is in Manhattan for the annual Research and Extension Conference here at the university. And we'll return with more from the conference in a moment. This is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. Each year, we ask extension agents from around the state to join us and discuss what's been happening agriculturally and different programs and or projects they are working on. And they are currently in Manhattan for the annual research and extension conference. Among them is Elisa Rippy May from the Twin Creeks District. Elisa, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now, what is the cornerstone of agriculture in the Twin Creeks District? Yeah, so in the Twin Creeks District, we are way up in the northwest corner of the state. So we're Graham, Decatur, Sheridan, and Norton counties. And I would say as the livestock agent, probably livestock production is the cornerstone of our ag production. Um, we have a lot of cow-calf operations out there, and they make up the vast majority of our farmers. And what's been going on agriculturally in your district? Yeah, so right now people are beginning to um, harvest corn. We mostly got done with Milo. Had a lot of wet corn get harvested earlier this year. Um, But yeah, we're just waiting for the corn to finish drying down and then get that out of the field. And on the producer side, how has things been going for those folks? Yeah, so... Like all of ag right now, everybody is probably struggling a little bit, but we've had really good yields this year, so that's a positive note. We had, of course, a horrible winter last year for our livestock. Um, Thankfully, the rain that continued through the summer did help green up our pastures. We've had a lot of grass growth out there, which has helped put a lot of pounds on cows. 
Yeah, so hopefully we're we're looking at an okay winter this year to, to help us continue to heal from that. Things are starting to hopefully look up. Yes, yeah. What are some projects and or programs that your district's been focusing on? Yeah, so we've had a number of meetings recently. I'll highlight just the the Farm Bill trainings. So we've had county Farm Bill meetings that some of my fellow colleagues have done. And then we had a regional Farm Bill meeting just talking about the new Farm Bill um, and what decisions producers have to make to be successful in that. Um, And then the program we have coming up is the Rancher Rules of Thumb program. I'm really excited about that. There's going to be three locations in western Kansas. We're all working together. So it'll be in Russell, Atwood, and Oakley. Um, It'll be November 13th and 14th in that we're bringing in um, Bridger Fays from the University of Wyoming. He's going to come talk about kind of the rules of thumb that he's seen from producers across the the state and then kind of what data will back up or refute those rules. Um, So I think it'll be a really good program, something outside the box. I mean, I'm excited about it. So if anybody's interested, they can contact the extension offices in those towns and get on the list. Another event that we have coming up is the Tri-State Cattle Expo. That is an annual event that we hold in Oberlin, Kansas at the Gateway Civic Center. Um, We have a number of really good speakers coming out for that. I'm really excited about it. So we have Dr. Rick Funston from UNL Extension. He is going to come talk about heifer development. And then we'll have Dr. Bob Weber from here at K-State. He's going to talk about heifers and reproduction, too. We'll have Dr. Bob Larson come out from the K-State Vet School. And then a number of other more local speakers. So for the entertainment for the day, we're also going to have the Peterson Brothers on December 3rd. I'm really excited about that. You can either come for the entire conference or just to see the Peterson Brothers. And then we will have portion focused specifically to FFA kids that following day. So we're really excited about that, getting kids in there learning about the opportunities in agriculture and the hearings from some local producers and some of those academic experts as well. And then they'll get some one-on-one time with the Peterson brothers too. So super excited for that whole program. Um, And if anybody is interested, just look up Tri-State Cattle Expo at the Gateway Civic Center and it should come up. Now, is there a registration fee for that? Yeah. So you can buy tickets for one day or both days and it's $25 per day. Perfect. That sounds like a really interesting and educational event that you guys are putting on. Yes. Yeah. We're very excited to host this again. Well, thanks, Elisa, for being here. Yes. Thank you for having me, Britton. That was Elisa Rippy May, an extension agent from Twin Creeks District. Continuing with our agents from around the state, next we bring you Lacey Noterman from the newly formed Wild West District. This district is made up of Stewart, Stevens, and Haskell County. Lacey, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Lacey, as I mentioned earlier, the Wild West District is newly formed. How did that formation become? In the Southwest, we've always been really good about partnering up with each other, each other's counties as well. And we do share, prior to the district, we did share programming across the different counties. We started our relationship by the programming, and then K-State has been a huge advocate about districting, and we felt like it was it was time for us to take the initiative and take that first step into it. Financially, it was also a advantage to district. All of us agents in those three counties work well together, have a good working relationship, and so that was probably one of the head starters of it. As you mentioned earlier, the working relationship is really key to this. Mm -hmm. How has the formation overall been working? It's been going well. It definitely has a few challenges, but we have fared well through it. A lot of meetings where we sit down and we discuss for hours on hours about who's going to do what and how we're going to handle things, but it's been working well. Now, it's been dry in the southwest corner of Kansas. How has your district been doing agriculturally this past year? Good. We actually have had some rain this year, and so we're pretty dry right now, but this spring was kind of wet compared to what it has been in the past. I would say that, you know, they're just hanging in there and taking whatever Mother Nature gives them. So there has been challenges. How has producers in your district dealt with those? They just keep trucking. They keep doing what they're doing. They keep going back and learning about different crops, maybe that require less water usage. Well, now that your extension program is up and running, What makes the Wild West District unique? 
Right now we have Ron Honick in Stevens County. He is our agronomist. He was a crop consultant and he's ready to get hands dirty and in that situation we have a community development Kylie Harrison who has came up with tons of new ideas on programming and and getting out there into the community. We have Myrna and Nancy and Kristen who are uh, working hard in the facts department and we're feeding off of each other and we're working well together and I expect to see some pretty good programming ideas that come out of our district. Lacey, you mentioned programming. What sort of programs are you expecting to roll out in this next year? We are working pretty hard right now on the farm bill. That's a huge program right now that the farmers are focusing on. We will be offering one in January through the district. I know that they're doing aging programming Mm -hmm. with facts, so those will be some upcoming programs that will be available in the district. Now, are there any projects that you guys are looking forward to? You know, we're still farming, and so these questions are a little difficult um, because we're still trying to find our niches and find our our place in the district. I would say that we're all looking forward to what our future is like in the district because right now it's definitely that building era, and hopefully by next year we'll see some bigger programming. You know, the agents in our district come on all different levels. We have agents that have been there for 25 years, agents that have been there for two years. And so... So how are you guys working with that? It's hard. Right now, our main focus was to figure out what we wanted to specialize in. Mm -hmm. And then we're going from there. But we're feeding off of each other. The agents that have been there for 25 years, you know, they obviously have more experience. And the agents that have been in there for two years, you know, they're teaching us people that have been in the system for a while these new ideas. You're really weaving in the old and the new and trying to make something unique to your district. Yeah, yeah. Now, Lacey, what are some of your views on agriculture in your district for the upcoming year of 2020? I'm excited. I think that we have some huge advocates in our district for agriculture. We are agriculture-based counties. That's what we live and breathe. Hemp production has been a huge up and new coming crop in Haskell County, especially. Um, So that'll be interesting to see where that works into the system at. And that is currently being grown in In Haskell Haskell County. County. Have you guys had a harvest yet? I think they are harvesting some. They're drying some right now. And how has that gone? From what I've heard, really well. And what has been the overall perception of growing the crop in your county? I think people are intrigued by it. They don't know what to expect from it. I think at first it was kind of a, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're planting hemp. You know, it's a multi-use plant, and I've heard good things that it's growing well in Haskell County, and it's harvesting really well, and it'll be interesting to see how it does play out. Know that they're having a little problems with marketing it because of our location. It's definitely been a conversation piece or a conversation starter to a lot of programs that we have <laughs> no. lately. So, Will you implement that in your educational system in your district? We have already. We just had a basic informational program last spring, which had a tremendous turnout. You know, in the little town of Haskell County, I think we had 90-some people there. So it's interesting. Well, Lacey, thanks again for coming here and discussing your newly formed district and an insight of what's happening in Southwest Kansas. That was Lacey Noterman in the southwest portion of the state in the Wild West District, including counties in Haskell, Seward, and Stevens. She's among the many local extension agricultural agents in Manhattan this week for the annual K-State Research and Extension Conference. Tomorrow we will speak with two more agents from the eastern part of the state, Richard Fector of the Rolling Prairies District and Jody Holthouse from the Meadowlark District. I'm Britton Rucker, and this is Agriculture Today. When we return, Eric will have the agricultural news headlines and more all over the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
This is the K-State Radio Network, and welcome back to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. On we go now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. A House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee will hold a hearing next Tuesday on the Trump administration's use of small refinery exemptions relative to the renewable fuel standard. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Colin Peterson is welcoming that hearing. It's not yet clear who will be testifying on behalf of the administration. Meantime, a suit has been filed by a coalition of biofuel supporters over the EPA rationale for granting small refinery exemptions for the 2018 compliance year. That lawsuit was filed with the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. The groups cited an August document from the EPA detailing its rationale for resolving 36 SREs for 2018 in their lawsuit. And quoting the language in that suit, unlike previous years, the EPA's entire decision document was only two pages long. In these short two pages, they write, EPA purported to resolve 36 pending petitions for disproportionate economic hardship exemptions, a decision that exempted small refineries from having to blend almost one and a half billion gallons of renewable fuel. Again, the coalition writing that in a joint release. In the document, the EPA explained that it granted full exemptions in cases where the Department of Energy had recommended only partial waivers. The court challenge was filed by the American Coalition for Ethanol, Growth Energy, the National Biodiesel Board, National Corn Growers Association, National Farmers Union, and the Renewable Fuels Association. Now, several of those groups reportedly had brokered a deal with the White House earlier this month to account for the biofuel gallons exempted from the RFS. In future years, the details of that agreement outlined by biofuels and agriculture sources that were part of a briefing call with the administration prior to the announced deal and the proposed remedy from the EPA remain at odds. Industry groups contend the EPA did not follow the agreement while the agency stands by the proposal as consistent with the agreement. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue is touting U.S. relationships with Japan, one of the country's largest agricultural export markets. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue highlighted the importance of trade at the annual meeting of the Southeast U.S.-Japan Association in Savannah, Georgia. While we like to think about states and nations doing business together, Really, people do business together. And these opportunities, like the Seuss japan relationship, forge those independent relationships, whether it's the CEOs of Japanese companies or the CEOs of U.S. companies, being able to meet here and develop those personal relationships of trust. And he added he is optimistic about agricultural export opportunities to Japan. Japan, obviously, is one of our largest customers in 2018, with our third largest export destination, and is growing with the recent Japan-U.S. arrangement that President Trump negotiated. The bilateral there, the, well, that partnership is going to be cemented even, even closer in that regard. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And this morning, the International Grains Council cut its forecast for grain production as a third year of drought in Australia drags on global wheat output. The intergovernmental organization reduced its forecast for grain output in the 1920 season to 2.15 billion metric tons. That was down from the September report. Strong harvests in the European Union and Russia partly offset the cuts to the outlook for wheat production in Australia and Argentina. Wheat prices have risen in recent weeks, driven by strong demand in Egypt, the world's top importer of the grain, and dry weather in Australia. However, the IGC forecasts are unlikely to lead to a further rally in prices, since that organization also cut its forecast for global grain consumption by 2 million tons, down to 2.18 billion tons. We'll be taking this up further with K-State's Dan O'Brien, by the way, as Dan has just put together a comprehensive wheat market overview that he'll be presenting at an Agricultural Outlook conference later this week in Denver. He'll be in to talk about all of that during his weekly grain market segment on tomorrow's broadcast right here. And that leads us right into this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. Standing by, as always, is Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Doug Bounds, Kansas State statistician for USDA's National Ag Statistics Service, joins us. And Doug, USDA has released several reports concerning the current state of soybeans across Kansas. Let's first start out with the latest crop progress update. Yeah, Greg, for the most recent crop progress and condition report uh, for the week ending October 20th, we saw that soybean condition rated 57% good to excellent. Um, only 11% was very poor to poor, and 32% was fair. 93% of the plants were dropping leaves. That's pretty close to last year's total and that five-year average. Harvest was, had jumped up to 32%, which is ahead of last year that was 22%, but uh, behind the five-year average of 41%. And Doug, USDA earlier this month released the latest crop production estimates for this year. That's right. Uh, we did some acreage and production forecast. Soybean production, we forecasted 195 million bushels here in Kansas. That's uh, 3% lower than last year. We're looking at um, about 4.54 million acres of soybeans to be harvested in the state, which is also 3% less than last year. And our forecasted yield is at 43 bushels per acre, which is equal to the final yield from last year um, and down a one bushel from our September 1 forecast. And Doug, USDA also released the crop ending stocks report back on September 30th. That's right. For Kansas soybean stocks, old crop soybeans, stored in all positions, we had 46.8 million bushels. That's 154% more in storage than there was at the same time last year. If we look at on-farm stocks, there's 5.5 million bushels stored in, on farm in Kansas. That's 67% higher than last year. And then looking at off-farm stocks, uh, we had 41.3 million bushels. That's 172% higher than last year at the same time. All right. Doug, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That is Doug Bounds, Kansas State Statistician for USDA's National Ag Statistics Service, updating us on the current state of the soybean crop across the state of Kansas and where it may finish at the end of 2019 as well. On the Kansas Soybean Update, it's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. Greg and Coggy there. The weather has turned cooler, and landscape bugs are looking for a safe winter haven, like your house. We'll talk about that with our guest next on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, our horticulture segment for this week. You shouldn't be surprised that there are insects still at work in our landscape settings. And they may not be as intense as they would be during the warmer part of the year. But as we ease deeper into the fall, here are some pests to possibly look out for. Raymond Cloyd is alongside again, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. So, Raymond, we did have some rather sharp cold weather a few days back, but that hasn't completely deterred insects out there. Has it? In no way, Eric. I mean, insects and mites are resilient. But every year, about uh, October, early November, we have these nuisance pests. And one in particular is the Asian ladybird beetle. That's a ladybird beetle that is orange with about 19 black spots. And you can always tell they have an M shape on their thorax, which is the segment between the head and the abdomen. And what they'll do is they'll be on the south side of a white house or whatever, sun themselves, and then they start moving in. Mm-hmm. And and that's when you really should start sealing cracks and crevices and be aware this is the time of year they're going to start moving into your home. And if you've had them previously, you know they'll go to the uh, window seals, they'll go to the very corners and reside there for the winter time. Now, do they move in in hordes or in small numbers? What? It really depends, Eric, uh, what the populations are. Uh, they normally will do small congregations, but if there's a lot of them out there, there you could have them by the hordes coming in, yeah. And they're 
they're a nuisance. They're really not causing any trouble other than you don't want them hanging around in your living room, for instance. Why? Right. There's no potential for vector transmission. They will bite you, but it's minimal. Uh, what we do recommend is just vacuuming them up and then throwing your bags out in the, the weather, and, uh, you know, hopefully that'll help. I mean, there obviously there are no aphids, which is a predator out there for them to feed upon at this point. So the, they're just looking for a place to hang out for the wintertime, mm-hmm. as are things like crickets and millipedes and centipedes. Ants are going to be are coming in, things like that, mm-hmm. yeah. And you've said this many times before don't want to deploy any kind of insecticide control for these sorts of pests indoors. Not inside, Eric. I'm pretty adamant because you can run into some more problems. I mean, the best thing is seal cracks and crevices for the Asian ladybird beetle, crickets, um, other larger orthopods. But for smaller ones like, you know, ants, we do have the ant baits that you can put in your home, which are relatively safe around children and pets because their formulation is it's sealed in sort of a container. But no, we do not recommend like uh, aerosol sprays in the house. No, do not do that. Well, you tell us as well that the larvae of the green June beetle can be spotted fairly handily this time of the year. Yes, and, and let me go back, Eric. This year was an, a, a banner year for green June beetles, uh, mainly because of the rain and the moisture. Consequently, the larvae are coming out. They're, they're big, fat larvae. They're about an inch long, some longer. And they had this tendency to crawl on their back. And that's the only grub that does that. So when you see those things out there, and they can be in mass numbers, that's the green June beetle larva. And the, they're not a problem at all. There's a parasitoid that'll start attacking them also, but because of all the moisture and the high numbers of adults we had this year, consequently that's resulted in high numbers of the larval stage. So one can basically ignore those, although if they're that voluminous, they might be sending a signal that we'll have problems next year. Well, Eric, they don't. Re- they're not a damaging pest like the mass chafer, okay. a Japanese beetle larva. They feed on organic matter and grass clippings, so they're not. They're not a major problem like those. So there's. No, what a, I guess the point I'm trying to make is really no need to treat right. for them at this point because of they're less of a problem. But they're very noticeable. They're you know, big, fat, and juicy right. over an inch, and people will notice them uh, stepping on them possibly or whatever. Yeah, harmless by and large. So let them go about their business. You're telling us this week as well about something called the milkweed bug. Yeah, the milkweed bug. Milkweeds are still out there, and there's this milkweed bugs are about a half an inch, probably between half an inch and three quarters. They're orange with black markings on them, and they're feeding on the seeds of the buds of the milkweeds uh, when they're going to seeds. They're not harming the plant, but I just those those are they're really in abundance this year because we did see again because of the rain and moisture milkweeds in in, in large numbers, and so just be aware if you got milkweed out there, which you're using probably for the monarch butterfly, you'll see this orange blackish insect, and it's just sucking the juices out of the seeds, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it, it's again a harmless pest and an important part of the overall ecosystem when it comes to milkweeds? Yes, they're part of the ecosystem, yeah, but they're very noticeable too because of the distinct orange and black uh, markings or coloration on their body. All right. So, so far, we're talking about pests that ought to be minimally damaging or threatening at all here. One, two, talk a bit about protecting our fruit trees, those that have apples, pears, peaches, whatever in their home landscape settings. They could be thinking now about applying a dormant oil as a protection against insect damage, right? That's correct, Eric. When the uh, apples, pears, uh, apricots, peaches, nectarines, whatever growing, uh, loser leaves, uh, this time, that would be the time to apply what we call a dormant oil. A dormant oil is a volk like oil, and those are used to smother the eggs of insects and mites to overwinter the tree. European red mite, San Jose scale, others like that that overwinter. And if you do that, then you can minimize the numbers that are going to be a problem in the, in the spring and summertime in 2020. Now, those dormant oils, they will penetrate the bark and uh, get a, a good hit, if you will, on those mites and other damaging pests? Well, if you if you spray a high volume, I mean, these stages are overwinning on the branches. Yeah. So as long as you've got thorough coverage of the branches and the bark, that will result in high mortality of the, the life stages eggs, uh, in most cases, are unfertilized females, depending on the insect or mite pest. And as you're hinting, thorough coverage of that tree frame is essential here. Absolutely. Thorough coverage of all plant parts, and depending on the weather, you may have to make more than one application. That was the next question. Perhaps a follow-up in late fall, early winter, or... 
uh, if you're let's just say if you're making an application on your apples in December, you probably want to come back in January to make a second application, and that should do you for the rest of the the, the rest of the winter time. Yeah, depending depending on the product too. Obviously, read the label because the label will tell you how many sprays you should do in the winter time. Those labels on those products are very instructive, so take heed as to what those have to say about dormant oil usage on fruit trees, as those trees do turn off dormant here soon. If you'd like more information on any landscape insect issue that you might have, you can contact Raymond through your local extension office. Those folks can uh, make the connection there, and, and you can get some answers to your questions. Raymond, as always, many thanks to you for coming by. Eric, it's always a pleasure. Look forward to our next visit. Raymond Cloyd is a horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, and regularly on our K-State Horticulture segment. And once more, our time is away. We'll return this same time tomorrow. Hope you'll rejoin us then. Meantime, thanks for tuning in right here. Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.